So thank you for joining us this week um, and our new episode of Wollstone Craftivism. So each week we've been learning about different ac activists, crafters and artists and the work that they do um, and how they use their art to share their kind of political messages, political beliefs or get people to change their behaviour so that we can try and work towards a fairer world. And today we're joined by Sophie Pearson, who is a curator and producer. And um, we're lucky enough to be able to hear from Sophie. And I'm going to be asking her some questions about her work. So thank you for joining us, Sophie. And my first question for you is, um, you're the person behind Wollstonecraft Presents. In which ways do you use your creative practice to tell the story of Mary Wollstonecraft? Uh, well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. This is great. Um, so I have worked as a curator and arts producer for getting on for 20 years. Um, and my great passion is to work with contemporary artists uh, to tell stories, raise questions and interpret the world for us in ways that I feel connect with people. Um, and my favourite projects have been cross art projects that work specifically with um, a particular site or a particular story or perhaps a particular person and increasingly in recent years working with communities as well. So I feel that um, while gallery exhibitions definitely have their place and are super important, my interest is veering more working very in-depth with communities. Um, so I guess my, my, my latest work has been focused on Wollstonecraft and is bringing these different strands together. I have long, long been a fan of Mary Wollstonecraft's writing. It's really resonated with me for many, many years, ever since I read her biography, um, probably 15 years ago. Um, and she, she just feels so relevant to me. My project was really focusing on women in particular. Mm. Um, and I was thinking about how Mary Wollstonecraft's own reputation and voice was quite violently silenced as soon as she died and her husband, William Godwin, published this biography, which decimated her reputation until mm. the 1880s. So Pantheon was really about giving a platform. And I think, I think it, was, it was a really, really interesting project because we got you know we got stories of real women from mm. suffragettes like Katie Glidden and Cassandra who's a mythical woman to Kitty Wilkinson who set up the bathhouses in Liverpool um, during the cholera epidemics in the late oh, Victorian wow. era um, we've got works we've got a Mary Wollstonecraft piece here we've got mm. But we've also got works by artists just about womanhood, just about how that should be celebrated in itself. Mm. Um, and then we had a launch event at the National Portrait Gallery where I asked some really prominent um, women who have achieved so much in their professional lives to come and talk about their inspirations. And that was, that was a fantastic thing too. Mm. Um, and actually raised all sorts of questions as well. Um, so I feel like this thing is just going to roll and roll and roll and roll. And it's all Wollstonecraft is always going to be sort of the North Star mm. to my, my projects. She is, um, I just feel, I sort of feel like her voice is so needed. Mm. And when, and like the work that you did with the Pantheon scene, what do you hope that telling these hidden stories, these, these her stories, like you mentioned, yeah. what, what do you think by doing that, how, how will that change people's behaviour or thoughts or potentially, you know, in small ways and after a lot, after time, um, yeah. change the future? Well, Changing the future, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a big leap, isn't it? I think it only happens in tiny little incremental yeah. pages, as you say. And I think if somebody can pick up a pantheon and read about Kitty Wilkinson or uh, Katie Gledon or just see these really beautiful artworks that portray women 
in all their different ways. I mean, it's a small thing, but it's really, really powerful. Mm. And I think it's about changing perceptions of women and where we sit and that we are, you know, essentially we just need to be, there needs to be equality, doesn't there? And there still isn't. And there still isn't, you know, I mean, our society obviously has moved ahead in leaps and bounds and there are everywhere else pretty much it's in a we're in a much worse situation um i think it's about changing perceptions a tiny bit at a time and really starting with education i think the power of contemporary art particularly in the public sphere is to get people asking questions Mm. and until you ask questions and really start to question what's going on around you, what you're seeing in the newspapers, what's that story about, who was that about, oh, that's interesting, so why did that happen, why is that happening the way it is now? I mean, it's all about questioning, really, Mm. because we need to change the status quo, but we can't do that unless we start chipping away at it. Um, And I think there's been far too much acceptance of the way things are, And we're not going to change that unless we question. And I think that's the great power of art Mm. and cross arts. I don't mean just the painting on the wall. I mean, dancing, a mural, a public sculpture, um, somebody giving a really impassioned lecture, um, kids drawing with an artist on a particular Mm. theme or a subject you know, it all comes under the banner of creativity and art and it should all be used to question Mm. who we are and where we sit. Um, So, Sophie, that kind of brings me on to my next question, actually, which was about why why you think and, and perhaps why it is that you've got to this point where you're using art and curating art and working with artists to why that's a good format to tell a political message because i'm sure there's lots of other ways well there is lots of other ways that people do it you know you could get into local politics you could go on protests you know um so why what is it about arts and arts and crafts and the work that you do that that's a good format for that i think it's partly um i think it's partly because art can cover so many bases and can reach so many people in different ways you know, some people might relate particularly to music, others love their drawing, others will, I don't know, prefer writing or, I mean, I just think that art has the power to reach people in very particular ways. And I think that's why I'm becoming more and more interested in working with communities and working outside of the gallery space because galleries can feel a bit of exclusive and you know they can be expensive to get into and there's a huge place for a gallery exhibition but it's not for everyone yeah um and i am increasingly interested in being out there and working with communities and i think artists do have a unique place in interpreting what's going on around them whether that's relates to them or to society at large, mm. or just being chucking them a question, which is what I love to do, and just saying, look, here's this extraordinary woman, here are some things that she's written, what do you think? Um, and seeing what they come back with. And it's always interesting. It's always interesting. And then it's you know up to me to sort of interpret that in a way that is accessible to whatever audience it is that you want to reach. Mm. So the fanzine was great because that's, you can sort of throw a fanzine together quite quickly. It needn't be very expensive. And it's, you know, it's always been quite a sort of underground form of communication, which is really appealing as well. Um, yeah, so I think that, that's, that's what really drives me at the moment. Um, and going forwards, I think there's a lot to say about what's going on at the moment. And I'm really interested in presenting that to audiences, whoever they might be.
Sophie, as part of the, this programme, the young mm. people taking part are going to be creating something each week. And so yeah. I was thinking that perhaps this week they could create their own mini zine or something like that. And it could be inspired by your work. So we could ask them to, to pick an inspirational woman. It yeah. could be historical or it could be today. And they could create a, a little zine. Um, so I was wondering um, maybe if we could get some of your kind of top tips for that kind of thing what would your kind of um top tips be to to young people that are going to be making it their own zine oh well i suppose i mean it sounds very obvious but find one thing that really interests you about that person you know people are human beings are overwhelming we've all achieved quite a lot but if you can just find the one thing about that person that you think or oh, what they did there hmm. great I'm going to focus on that because otherwise overwhelming isn't it um so perhaps uh, something that they said something that they did um it could be you know if you're interested in fashion something that they wore you know something that makes you feel like this is great this is something that inspires me um and I suppose it's just don't be overwhelmed by everything else. Don't get distracted. That's okay. Whatever you think is interesting is interesting. My, my experience with kids and, and with adults actually is that they feel to say what interests them is that they feel a bit like, oh, well, why would anyone be interested in what I think? It's a comfortable mm. thing. And actually, whatever you think is interesting it's great that is interesting so just be brave and find the one aspect of your woman historical mythical contemporary mm. that you that really resonates with you and and go with that and don't be distracted by anything else that's a lovely message and actually last week we were learning um about um conformity or not conforming which was um the message from Sade, who um, is a co-founder of this organisation called the Black Exchange. Um, and she was talking about going to art school and feeling like she had to conform and, 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 and the, the types of art she created had to be, um, you know, certain types of art for them to be seen as successful or interesting. And, and her yeah. message was, was not to conform and to do something that is interesting for you and, and that maybe it wouldn't get such a big audience, but the audience that you'll get will be valuable and, and they will be interested in your work and that sometimes that's more important. Definitely, definitely. I mean, I think it's a message that adults and children could really learn. Yes. You know, what you think is, it, it matters, it's relevant. It doesn't matter, you don't have to try and kind of do what everyone else is doing. Hmm. Um, I feel like we're often kind of being told what to think all the time. You must believe this. You must. We're all going to take it in different ways, aren't we? And that's, mm. that's okay. No, it would be fascinating to see the work that comes out of this, the, yeah. the young people's scenes and things. That would be a great. So the last question, Sophie, for you is just about inspiration, where you get your inspiration from. Because um, the young people, like I said, will be creating their own little zines. So where, where do you get your inspiration from? When you create something for the, for the first time, who are you looking at? Where do you go to get information? Or even just what kind of environment do you work in best that would be quite interesting too um so i i read a lot i read a lot of uh, fiction and non-fiction i love films current affairs i'm sort of online a bit too much probably but i like following for example on social media i like following quirky characters for example, there are some professional mudlarkers who have mm. Instagram accounts who go down to the Thames and that's, I'm sure they have other jobs too, but this is on Instagram. They post pictures of things that they find in the Thames. And I don't know if you've ever done this or the kids that you're working with have done this, but it's really fun and it's free. Mm. And you just go at low tide, obviously, and just look around for what you find. And I've, I've done it loads of times. I've never found anything beyond a couple of pipes, but... 
I'm so interested in the clues that you can pick up that will swing you back 300 years to a street in Elizabethan London, for example. Yeah. Someone might have chucked their pipe or a coin over the bank and landed in the river. And hundreds of years later, someone picks it up and puts it on Instagram. I love that sort of thing. Mm. Um, there are local historians, again, on social media that I follow. There's a chap called Amir Dotan. I'm probably mispronouncing his name, who has done a whole series on manhole covers in Stoke Newington. And he's just fascinated, particularly about Stoke Newington. He does all these lectures on it. Um, but the manhole covers and how different they are and why they're so different. There are people that research why post boxes all mm. look So I'm in history and the sort of quirky edges of history. So like the people that find all those little clues around the edges then I think about how we live now mm. and I try to connect the dots and that sort of brings me back to how I feel artists can kind of interpret these things in a really interesting way. That's great and that's very much like the the work that the young people are going to be doing this week well if they choose a, a woman that's historical you know yeah. but uh, yeah and, and it's very much the work that, that we do at the Newington Green Meeting House. You know, Mary Wollstonecraft lived a couple of hundred years ago, but she's still very relevant. And lots of the people, um, you know, and things that people at the Meeting House wanted to change about the world, we are still trying to change about the world today, you know, to make sure. it fairer and more equal and things like that. So, so that's great. Well, thank you so much, Sophie. I think that's all our questions for this week. That's okay. Thank you for having me. It's such a pleasure.